the solar system and the Vedic Hindu scriptures. This presentation focuses on remarkable similarities between modern astronomy's perception of our solar system and the ancient Indian scripture, the Surya Siddhanta, but also the very ancient Indian scripture, the Bhagavad Purana, plus some references from the Rig Veda, Hanuman Chalisa and the Mahabharata. This is where they all cross over. Now, Vedic scriptures give an Earth-centered, a geocentric point of view. That is because ancient Indian astronomy is organic related to astrology. But yes, the ancient view was indeed where the Earth was kind of at the center. And about 1532 AD, perhaps it was understood that the Sun was at the center of the solar system. But in space, surely that's just a relative point of view. Who is orbiting who in this picture? Looking at our solar system, the heliocentric versus the geocentric. Here's a heliocentric, for example, with the Sun at the center, and here's Earth and Mars going around the Sun. Now you place the Earth at the center, and yes, the Sun is going around, sure enough, as you expect, but this means that the orbit of Mars from Earth's point of view is doing something quite different. It's doing an epicycle, actually. This diagram shows it more clearly. This is called an epicycle, and this is relevant for calculations in the Surya Siddhanta and the concentric rings described in the Bhagavad Purana, which we'll get into later. The Surya Siddhanta, the doctrine of the solar system. It is said that the science of the Surya Siddhanta has very ancient origins, but some conclude it was first written onto palm leaves in Sanskrit around 1500 BC. The text was revised in the 6th century AD and then modified in the 12th century. Now, Bhimal Prashar Dutta translated it into Bengali. He was a great scholar and an expert in Vedic astronomy. Later, however, he took to the holy order of sannyas and focused on the spiritual teachings contained in the scriptures like the Bhagavad Purana. Now let's look at the parallels between the Surya Siddhanta and modern astronomy. First of all, we have to look at the ancient uh, measurement, a distance measurement called the Yojana in the Vedic scriptures. And in this, we're taking it that one Yojana is equal to five miles in the Surya Siddhanta. The Moon. Here's the Earth there. Now, the modern size of the Moon is about 2,160 miles in diameter, and its average distance from the Earth about 238,900 miles. In the Surya Siddhanta, just a bit further away and slightly larger, but very, very similar. Interestingly enough, and again, corresponding with modern calculations, the distance between the Earth and the Moon is the same as 108 times the diameter of the Moon. Very interesting, we'll get into that magical figure later. The diameters of the planets. In the Surya Siddhanta 159, it describes that the Earth has a diameter of 1,600 Yojanas, that's about 8,000 miles. Again, very close to modern estimates. In the same scripture, 713, it reads, The diameters upon the Moon's orbit of Mars, Saturn, Mercury, Jupiter and Venus are reduced to 150 miles, 187.5 miles, 225 miles, 262.5 miles and 300 miles. Converted from Yojanas, of course. Now, in the 12th chapter, 85 to 90, we also get distances from the Earth, the orbital distances. Now, let's get a calculation. If we draw a, a two-sided triangle here with, with one point at the center of the Earth. We extend that to the distance that the Moon orbits the Earth. We get, and then we add those uh, lines they are apart at the reduced diameter as described in Chapter 7. We extend those lines and, as described for the distances in Chapter 12. And that third point of that triangle made is the diameter of each respective planet. For example, um, larger reduced diameter on the moon's orbit and bigger distances in the 12th chapter will lead us to a calculation of the diameters of larger planets. This is what we get if we use that calculation. Mars, Siddhanta is uh, just over 3,700 miles. Modern, 4,191 miles, quite close. Saturn, Siddhanta 73,882 miles. Modern, 72,000 miles in diameter. Mercury, Sucedanta, just over 3,000 miles. Modern, 3,100 miles. Very close. Now, if the diameter of Jupiter's doubled, it fits in very well. Perhaps the Sucedanta was referring to its radius instead. This could be down to the poetic nature of the verse. 
or simply human error. However, in this we can see that uh, you know Susa Danta calculates if, it, uh, if you calculate it that way, it has a diameter of 83,248 miles. Remarkable. Use the same formula uh, for Venus, and again we get a very similar figure for the diameter of that planet. And there's all the planets of the solar system in one big happy family. Distances of planets from the Sun. Of course, first of all, we need to understand what an astrological unit is. One AU is basically the um, modern calculation, and it, it's approximately to the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is about 93 million miles. In a Sudanta, the average distances of the planets of, from the Earth is given in these AU units. Today, of course, it is 93 million miles. The Sudanta itself does not include a familiar, similar figure. Somewhere along the line, the distance of the Sun and the size of the Sun was underestimated when compared with the modern. Yet, it's noteworthy that in the fifth canto of the Bhagavad Purana, the Earth's Sun distance ranges anything from 86 million miles away to about 100 million miles from the Earth. The average of that, 93,240,000 miles. Very interesting. In the Rig Veda, we understand the diameter of the Sun is 108 times that of the Earth. And remember, we know what the diameter of the Earth is. We get to a calculation of the size of the Sun as 864,000 miles in diameter. Very, very similar indeed to the modern calculation. We also learn Earth's Sun distance 108 times the size the, times the Sun's diameter. That leads us to a figure of 93,312,000 miles. Very, very, very consistent with the modern understanding. The Hanuman Chalisa describes the distance between the Earth and the Sun. The Sun is at a distance of Yug, Sahastra, Yotanas. Which basically means we get, again, a calculation of about slightly larger, 96 million miles away. Of course, the Earth is, the Sun-Earth distance is that sometimes. Using figures from the Suez Sedanta, one can calculate the astrological unit between the distance between the Sun and each planet. Now, of course, um, one astrological unit for the distance between the Sun and the Earth for both the Suez Sedanta and the modern. Working on that basis, let's look at the other planets. Mercury, Suez Sedanta, 0.368. Modern, 0.39. Very close. Suez Sedanta, Venus, 0.725. The modern, 0.72. Very similar. Looking at Mars, Suez Sedanta, 1.54. For the modern, 1.52 astrological units from the Sun. Very similar indeed. We can extend that now to the outer planets. Susadanta for Jupiter, 5.07 astrological units. Modern, 5.2. Susadanta for Saturn, 9.11. And for the modern, 9.55. Absolutely remarkable. Now, let's introduce ourselves to the Bhagavad Purana. The Bhagavad Purana, this ancient uh, scripture, one of the most, uh, of course, looking at the translation and commentary by A.C., Bhaktivinanta, Swami Prabhupada, and focusing on the fifth canto more than the others. It was first spoken by Sukadev Goswami to the king Parikshit about 5,000 years ago. Then Sutta Goswami recited it to the holy men in the forest of Namisharanya. Now, this scripture takes quite a different approach to reality. After all, what we call reality is only our brain's attempt to process mundane data supplied by our five senses. Therefore, we perceive the Earth as a simple globe in space and so forth. However, you could argue this is a kind of a prison. We're imprisoned by these five senses and imprisoned by the Earth. Anything we send out into space would also be limited to those five senses. Let's look at that from another point of view. Here's a modern astronomer here looking at the different planets in the sky. But Bhagavad Purana describes the universe is teeming with all kinds of higher dimensional life, and therefore these beings would see something different. Perhaps, even on, for example, one of the inner planets, they would see a planet full of mountains and trees and vegetation and the heavenly realm and so forth. Let's try and use an example to try to understand this. For example, let's say the demigods there, the higher beings, can see a city in three dimensions. Now our friend there with the mundane telescope will be looking at the same place, but would see perhaps, in this example, a two-dimensional image of the same thing. Both are right in their own way, but the views are different. Now the Bhagavatam describes links between places on Earth and heavenly realms. 
especially from the Central Asian mountains and Northern India. Now, it's understood that great holy sages, spiritually advanced beings like Veda Vyas will be in that Central Asian region and you'll be able to see things we cannot. For example, understood the earth is linked in some way that we cannot understand to huge, huge mountains uh, and huge, huge celestial realms far larger than what we're used to on the earth. In the center of that range of mountains is Mount Smeru, a huge, huge golden cone-like structure, and the top, the cities of the gods that protect the earth. Then Reverend Zag Bhagavatam describes that beyond that, beyond that is a uh, huge various um, ocean, for example, around the island of Jamadrib, and then a various um, rings, concentric rings of various heavenly lands and oceans around it. This is looking at the same thing here, a bit further away, but from above and the sun there going around the earth. So this is a geocentric version looking at the solar system. So the Sadaputta Das actually draws parallels between Bhumandala, this is the plain of Bhumandala, the concentric rings in the Bhagavatam, and the solar system. There it is with the earth at the center. Now interestingly enough, both are flat disks in space with very similar dimensions. Here's an image there of the solar system. In fact, it's flat from the modern point of view, even up to Neptune and the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt being, of course, various asteroids. Now remember, we looked earlier at the heliocentric version versus the geocentric version. We understood, didn't we, that the planets made that epicycle or made a certain type of cycle there. There it is again. Now from that, we can see various concentric rings formed out of the movements of the planets there from Earth's point of view. Here's a geocentric orbit there of Mercury. That's Venus. And that's Mars. Now you can't adding all these together, we can actually form a pattern, can't we? There, um, we're going right out in this diagram as far as the asteroids there, and of course, again, what is formed here from the various geocentric orbits of the inner planets is the um, concentric rings, as showed there by those orange arrows. And this diagram goes right up to the geocentric orbit of Jupiter. Now let's look at the heavenly realms described in Chapter 20 of the Fifth Canto. Marj Priyavata, his descendants occupied heavenly realms accessible from our inner solar system region that we cannot see. So look at the comparison here. This is Bumandala here. There's Plaxodreep and its ocean, Samaladweep, Kushadweep, Kraunchadweep, Sakadweep and ocean, and Pushkaradweep and its surrounding ocean. Looking at Kushadweep, for example, we can understand, as we said before, the demigods, the high beings, would be able to see this. Um, way, a different way of looking at the moon, where there's kusha grass on the moon with houses and people and temples and so forth. But our mundane astronomer would only see the same moon made of grey rocks and craters. This is interesting because it corresponds very closely with the Vedic conception of Rahu, a dark, kind of uninhabited planet. And in the Bhagavatam, the value of the Yodhana is slightly different. It's about 8 miles, rather than 5 miles, as in the Sura Siddhanta. And from those various uh, Bumandala rings, we can get the geocentric orbits there, co correspondence links, if you like, between Venus, Mars, and Mercury. Some, perhaps, co corresponding to some kind of high-dimensional realm that we cannot understand. Bhaskaradweep, Sakadweep, and Kraunchadweep, and all its respective populations and oceans and various types of flora. And, of course, corresponding with um, uh, Kartikeya here, there's the, it's interesting that the Bhagavatam explains that the, um, the war general Kartikeya attacked the underground hideout of some demons in that realm, Kaunchadri, and in the process destroyed all the vegetation there. Now some modern astronomers do believe that Mars once had water and vegetation, but it disappeared after a huge series of explosions. Was Kartikeya responsible in a high dimensional way? Who knows? Going back here to Bumandala there, Demigods maintain order within the boundary of Manasatara, just traced out there, just beyond the geocentric orbit of the sun. The demigods protecting the earth include, in different directions, Indra, Yamaraj, Varuna, and Soma. Now the outer rings of Bumandala. Again, we looked at the, um, the inner rings of Bumandala, corresponding that to the inner rings of the solar system. Now let's go out. Many living beings live in the ocean there, uh, sorry, the ocean uh, beyond that of, of Mars. It's corresponding with Ceres and other asteroids. Then we have Jupiter and its moons, and Saturn and its moons. 
closing in here, of course, this between the um, orbits there of Jupiter and Saturn, we get what the Babbitt describes as the Golden Lands. Closing in here, looking from the eye point of view, as described there in the purple arrow, looking a bit closer to Jupiter. These are golden reflective lands, abandoned because objects never return after going in. And just beyond the orbit of Saturn there is Loka Loka Mountain, where no one, no human eye can see any planets. It's also understand this golden area here, especially in the area of Saturn, diamonds can be retrieved. So now we're going beyond the, the golden lands, we're looking back now on top of Grandula. Loka Loka Mountain, and beyond that is a Loka Varsh. That's a place in near darkness, can hardly be seen from the earth with the naked eye, and no life there is possible. And the, the edge of Loka Loka Vars corresponds there with planet Uranus. Looking now up to the um, geocentric orbit there of planet Uranus, just far from the side. Now, of course, in modern astronomy, of course, there's the planet Neptune and the Kuiper Belt there. However, when we turn to the Vedic scriptures, there doesn't seem to be any references, of course, to Neptune at all, whether in astronomy or astrology. So, does that leave our poor planet Neptune out in the cold? Well, not exactly, actually. In the Mahabharat, Vedivyas said to Lord Ganesh, Shamaloka, which translates as a dark blue planet, is in Jaista. He said this, describing a astrological constellation, and that must have been about 3102 BC. Look at the red line there. We can see that traces out to the fact that all the planets at the time of, of the beginning of the Mahabharata there were in line. That included that dark blue planet Neptune, and also, for that matter, Uranus. Vedavyas also described the dark blue planet as Sadum, smoky. That's interesting, because modern astronomers do believe Neptune has a rocky core, surrounded by a thick, smoky atmosphere with tremendous winds. Thanks for watching. Wasn't that interesting? You can see some of my other YouTube presentations, entitled Astronomy of the Bhagavad Purana, Parts 1 to 3, and, and the summary version, the Sura Siddhanta, Parallels with Modern Astronomy, and Alien Identities in the Vedic Hindu Scriptures. And that's my email address. Please get in touch. Thanks a lot.